Good morning. Again, it is good to see each and every one of you here, and what a blessing. It is that we can come and study God's Word on even a cool morning like it is in the comforts uh, of this building, that we can gather together in fellowship to study God's blessed Word to sing such wonderful songs. What an opportunity and a blessing it truly is. I have been uh, enjoying the study concerning uh, spiritual beings in which we've been going over and examining here on Sunday mornings over the last several weeks. And as Tom mentioned, next week we will be looking at Satan, of course, the master of the uh, evil, uh, that is, and the demon's master, if you will. And he mentioned that we'll be talking about and discussing the origins of Satan. Now, what he forgot to say was he's going to actually cover that part, uh, and then I will get up right after that and, and cover that, the rest of it. But no, we will be looking at Satan and examining, of course, the dangers that he presents. And as we look at today, we're going to finish up uh, talking about demons and going to look at what the Bible says concerning demons, the truth, in other words, about demons. Because there's a lot of misconceptions, as we discussed last week. There's a lot of myths out there as we looked at some of those and kind of talked about some of the history behind the word demon. As we talked about and discussed the uh, ancient peoples, like the Greeks, the Mesopotamian people, the Egyptians, they all had words for demon. And they talked about demons and discussed demons. And as we looked at it, it really started out that word meaning good or evil. And it was typically designated towards uh, deities or uh, idols of those people, gods, if you will, as they looked at it, little g's of those people. And then it was sometimes said or sometimes looked at as well, especially in Mesopotamia, and that kind of grew forth of this demigod idea, this lesser than the deities, but nevertheless a very powerful super uh, uh, spiritual beings called demons. And these, as the Mesopotamian people kind of had their seven demons in the Hadean or underworld as we discussed, and looked at and and so they became eventually known as as not good anymore but but of evil of any problem that happened to mankind well it was a demon that caused that whether the the peoples looked at it as uh, gods or demigods or just simply spiritual beings that were causing problems this is the situation this is the history leading up into new testament times leading up into the point where that fullness of time would come and Jesus would be born of woman, God would become flesh. And as we discussed at that, and as we looked at that, we mentioned that, listen, when it comes to demons in the Bible, there's not a lot of information. There's not a lot of things out there that gives us a, a full picture, if you will. But there are a number of things in which we can understand a number of truths in which we can grasp and we're going to look at those this morning and so with that in mind if you have your hand out let's go ahead and look at our first point what exactly are demons what are demons to ask this question and answer it we need to first look at some of the many theories that are out there to look at many of the theories that are out there. And there are a lot of theories about the origins and therefore the who exactly demons are and what they are. Now we know their, their makeup, and we'll get into that in the next point as far as spiritual beings. But where did they come from and, and what are they made of and all these kind of questions. As I said, there's a number of theories. I'm going to look at just a handful of the most popular ones and examine those. Of course, you have those today, the ancient superstition uh, theory. And this is done by modernists. Now, what are modernists? Modernists are those that do not believe in any supernatural activity in the Bible. In other words, they don't believe in miracles. They, they actually believe in God and believe in the Bible, but they don't believe in any of the supernatural stuff. They don't believe in any of the miraculous stuff. And so because of this, They'll twist and manipulate 
and change scripture around to fit their idea. But because they do not believe in the miraculous, they do not relieve the Bible as written, they reinterpret and what is oftentimes called spiritualize the text concerning demons. And so they'll, they'll make it something, as we'll talk about in just a second, like the next uh, theory that's out there. They'll, they'll speculate and they'll, they'll think, but it has nothing to do with the Hadean realm, has nothing to do with Satan, has nothing to do with any of that kind of stuff in the invisible realm because it, it, they don't believe in the supernatural. They don't believe demons could have ever uh, possessed uh, or been cast out because they were never actually there. So that's the ancient superstition. Then there is the ancient misunderstanding of physical elements. Now, as we talked about last week, the Greeks, the Mesopotamian, the Egyptians, a lot of people back in ancient times, whenever a physical element would come up, or uh, the Egyptians less so on the disasters, they didn't look at those as demons, those were gods, but, but most of the, the known world over there, in the Bible lands and beyond Babylon, and, and east and north, and things of that nature, when physical ailments would take place, and the Greeks were ones who really got this started, when seizures or maladies, sickness, things like this would happen, they started to say, listen, demons are the ones causing this. This person is possessed by a demon. And so because of that, we, and because of what we know uh, concerning that, and many of the things written concerning that, people said, well, listen, this is ridiculous. They're, they just were sick. They didn't actually have a demon. They just didn't know how to understand cancer or they didn't know how to understand uh, maybe Ebola if they got it. They didn't know how to understand a person with seizures. And so they would just make up things and say, well, uh, uh, some supernatural being like a demon must be causing these kinds of illnesses, must be coming, causing these kinds of problems. So they take that idea... And they put it within the Bible and say that's the case throughout it. Even in the New Testament, they will say that, listen, when the demon is talked about and a seizure is mentioned or a mutinous or something, it's not really a spiritual being. It's just a misunderstanding of physical problems. And so that's the ancient misunderstanding of physical ailments theory. Obviously, this doesn't hold water. Jesus talked. To the demons. They talked back to him. That's not a misunderstanding unless one misunderstands the gospel. Once again, very uh, normal to that of the previous one, just ancient superstition. The next one is that they these demons are offspring of angels and humans. Now this is probably the second most popular, second most popular, if not the most popular, but uh, usually the second most popular theory out there, and that is at a point in history, usually it's said somewhere in Genesis chapter 6, the fallen angels or angels who left their home and came to earth, they mated with women and produced demons, spiritual beings. Now, <clears throat> when we look at that, there's a problem with that uh, uh, for multiple reasons, but the main problem is <clears throat> when you look at the Old Testament, <clears throat> And you look at the Jews and the history and what God writes, only a handful of times is the word demon found. And of those times it's found, it always, where the word demon is found, it's always talking about idol worship. It's not talking about supernatural beings. Even the demon goat, as some translations have it, is talking about idol worship. Now, why is that the case? Because remember, in that point in time, in that history, demons were considered gods or demigods. They were worshipped. And so during Old Testament times, there is zero indication, <clears throat> man, zero indication that demons had any ability to um, affect humankind physically, to possess them, to cause them pain, to cause them problems like uh, what we see. There's nothing in the Old Testament to actually indicate that or say that. And so it doesn't make any sense uh, that uh, demons would be the ones who are the offspring of angels with human women. It, just, it doesn't add up with Scripture. 
it doesn't hold true. In fact, it wasn't until that 400 years of silence where there's no inspired books written that we have saved between Malachi and the book of Matthew or Jesus' birth that we see the Jews talking about demons really at all in the same sense that we see them uh, discussed about in the New Testament or in ancient literature, possessing people or taking them over, things of that nature. And there you see in the Apocrypha, which are usually very fanciful uh, ideas in the book of First Enoch and things like that, demons being talked about. But in the Old Testament itself, uh, every time demons are mentioned, it's dealing with idol worship. And so it doesn't make any sense that these fallen angels who mated with men, women uh, somehow made these demonic beings. The next one goes along and really uh, puts it in also to the other one. And this idea of fallen angels, this is the most popular of all of them. Demons are fallen angels. That when they fell, when they were uh, when they uh, left their home and they sinned, that uh, they became demons. Now, as we discussed last week, this isn't the case. Jude 6, 2 Peter 2 and verse 4, says the angels who sinned, who left their home, left heaven and sinned, they're in hell. They're chained up in hell awaiting judgment, awaiting the second coming of Christ. They don't have that opportunity to still be about and to be going about. And so that theory that they're fallen angels, which is, like I said, the most popular theory, is not biblically sound either. The last one is that they are spirits of dead men. Alexander Campbell and other uh, notable men have taught, though this is probably the least popular one of all, have taught that for a time that the spirits of evil men, dead men, were allowed to come, were allowed to uh, inhabit or make a home and human uh, hosts and basically cause havoc. Okay? And so that is a basic idea. We talked a little bit about that last week, that they're fallen men. It doesn't, once again, seem to hold up with Scripture, Luke 16, 22 and 23. When the evil die, they go to torment. And they are there awaiting judgment. Now, one thing you'll notice in saying this is that I did not point out that what, where they came from. We don't know. The Bible doesn't say. These are popular theories. But the reality is the Bible does not give us enough information to make an accurate conclusion. When it comes to the truth about demons and what they are or their origins, their beginnings, their story from the beginning, we simply don't know. We do know they were created good. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 16 and 1 Timothy 4, 4 says, listen, God created everything, didn't he? And he created everything good. We know they were created good, but past that, when they fell, how they became this demonic being, or, or maybe that was always their name, and how this became evil, whatever that is, we simply do not know. Just like we know Satan was created good, and he fell, became the father of all lies, as we'll talk about later, we simply don't know his origin story. We're not given that information. Maybe when we get to heaven, that information is given, but... Uh, you know what? We might not ever know. So the reality is we simply don't know where they began or how they got started. The truth about it is we can't know those things. So what are facts concerning demons? What are some facts about demons that we can know? Well, as I alluded to earlier, we can know what they are made up of. In other words, we know in the Bible there is the physical realm and the spiritual realm. Demons are not physical. They are spiritual beings. And notice what Scripture says in Matthew chapter 8 and verse 16. That evening they brought to him many who were oppressed by demons. And he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were sick. Here we see Jesus in the Bible uh, describing demons as also spirits. And so when we look throughout the scriptures, whether it's be said to be unclean spirits or whatever the case may be, demons were not physical beings. Like angelic beings, they weren't physical beings, though they could take on possibly that characteristic of whom uh, they possessed. They were not themselves physical. They were spiritual. Every instance, there is no instance of a physical demon. They were all spiritual 
beings in Matthew chapter 10, just a couple of chapters over verse 1. And he called to him his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. Here we see again that unclean spirit. In Luke chapter 24, verse 39, we read this. See my hands and my feet, that is myself. Touch me and see, for notice a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. Spirits do not have flesh and bone. And so demons, which are spiritual, just like the angelic beings, demonic beings that are spiritual, they have no physical attributes. They are fully and completely, simply uh, spiritual beings. Now, when we look through scriptures, there's some things we learn concerning demons and how they interacted with their human hosts. They caused a great deal of affliction on people. When you go through the scriptures, now 85 point, someone else did this math, not me, but 85.9% of every time the word demon or uh, unclean spirit, whatever the case may be, is mentioned in the New Testament, 85.9% of the time it's in Matthew, Mark, or Luke. Actually, John doesn't mention uh, demons hardly at all. But in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we get most of that. John, a few of those. And the rest of them is found in the book of Acts, Corinthians, Romans, some other places, uh, describing demons, even reflecting back to their old thoughts and their idolatry. So what does that tell us? Well, we learn a lot about demons in the gospel accounts and some of the things in which they caused mankind. Demons at one time could cause people to have both physical and mental anguish. They could cause muteness in people. They could be cause people to become mute, couldn't talk. In Matthew 9, 32, as they were going away, behold, a demon oppressed man who was mute was brought to him. The demon was removed. The man could talk. They were able to make people blind. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 22, we read about uh, a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute here, who was brought to him, and he healed him so the man spoke and saw. Here we see that demons, when they possess people, could make people uh, blind. They could cause multiple afflictions, as we see here. Probably one of the more agonizing realities with this is the mental torment and anguish that could be inflicted on someone who had one or more demons. In the book of Mark, chapter 5, verse 2 through 5, we read this account about a man who was possessed by a demon. And when Jesus had stepped out of the boat immediately, there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit or a demon. He lived among the tombs, and no one could bind him any more, not even with a chain, for he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart, and he broke the shackles in pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. Notice verse 5, though. Night and day, among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. Imagine the, the mental anguish that is uh, upon those at this time who are... Uh, dealing with demon possession. They're cutting themselves. They're in such pain. They're crying out. They're, they're in torment mentally. And we see that throughout. The ones who were taken possession by demons during these biblical times. In Matthew 17, 14 through 18, we read about the seizures they could inflict and the harm they could cause their host. And when they came to the crowd, a man came up to him and kneeling before him said, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he has seizures and he suffers terribly. For often he falls into the fire and often into the water. And I brought him to your disciples and they could not heal him. Heal him. And Jesus answered, O faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon and it came out of him and the boy was healed instantly. Here we see a seizure was taking place where he would lose uh, control of his physical self and he would be sometimes uh, lose control into a fire or into a water. You can imagine the horror of any family having to deal with that. And we see here again, demons had great control physically and mentally 
over those whom they possessed, over those whom they would, uh, their, their bodies they would take, it would become their home. Uh, Paul this morning alluded to the scripture where the demon leaves the person and he goes and he, he goes, of course, to the desert and then goes back and finds the house has been clean, but it has not been filled up. And so he goes and takes other demons, brings them back, and they go into the human again. But notice there it says the home. They find home there. So this was their abode. This is where they tried to go. They needed, they weren't allowed just to simply wander around. They needed a home to go. And when they found that home, when they possessed that person, it caused great physical and mental anguish. Demons today, according to the scriptures, are able to not cause physical damage. They're not able to take over and possess people, but they are able to cause spiritual anguish. Satan, as we remember, is their leader. They follow their leader. In fact, in the book of Revelation chapter 12, we see of Satan and his angels or his messengers, better translation there, it says, and the great dragon that Satan was thrown down and the ancient serpent who was called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world, he was thrown down to the earth and his angels or his messengers were thrown down with him. The demons have a leader. It's not God, though he is their ultimate authority. They have a master and it's Satan. Remember what Jesus said, you can only serve uh, one of two masters. It's either God or it's mammon. It's, it's the physical, the Satan-led world. So it's really either God or Satan. They have chosen to follow Satan. They teach the doctrine of Satan. When we look at the Bible there in John 8 and 44, we read this. You are of your father the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. This is who Satan is. This is his doctrine. It's based on lies. Now notice what his messengers or followers teach. In James 3 and verse 15, this is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. He's talking about worldly wisdom, sinful doctrine. When we look at the scriptures, we realize they do this like their master. In the same way as Satan today, they tempt us. They don't possess us, but they tempt us. It's not physical possession, but it's possession through temptation. Look what the Bible says again in Acts chapter 5 and verse 3 about how Satan... Uh, possesses one, if you will. In Acts 5, 3, Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? This is today how Satan tempts us. When we fall into that temptation, Satan fills our heart, doesn't he? In the same way, demons follow after their master. In 1 Timothy 4, 1 and 2, notice what it says. Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits, lying spirits, and the teachings of demons through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared. So how do demons affect us today? They, like Satan, tempt us. And when they get someone to believe the lie, they get someone to fill their heart with deceitfulness and evilness, they have afflicted spiritual anguish on those who are caught up in such. In 1 John chapter 4, and verse 1, that's why John wrote, inspired by God, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. Those who teach false doctrine have had their hearts filled with Satan and his followers' message. Though demons do not possess us physically today, that time has ended. It was just a short period of time. Though that time has ended, they still can influence us if we listen to the lies of their master Satan and that which they preach and those they've got to follow such. When we look at this and we examine this, we see the dangers, the truths, that come forth. The last truth I want to really, or fact I want to talk about, 
And this particular point is the exorcism or the removal of the, the demon. Why is it so important? <clears throat> Me and Carol Moses were talking this morning before Bible class started, and we were talking about demons and, and things along those lines a little bit. And I said, listen, one of the reasons I, I started studying this or really preparing lessons on this teaches is because it's amazing how many people today in, in the world don't understand the truth concerning them. They, there's so many fanciful things out there, so many things that have gone out from ancient times and secular writings to denominationalism to movies and their elaborate ideas that people don't understand the truth and the facts concerning them. We're going to run across, in other words, people that think demons can possess them today. And so one quick way to show how this is not true, one way to examine this and look at this is, listen, to look back and understand the history again. As we discussed last week, demons have always had this idea. Once they kind of got to this idea of taking people over, there's always been this idea of exercising them or removing them. And as I said before, the Jews were not uh, into this. They didn't deal with that. It was sin to even consider this kind of idea of witchcraft and sorcery or anything along those lines. It was always just sinful. And, and though they might have embedded in it, uh, they were in sin and even thinking about it. But as I said, as things went along and as things got later, we started seeing more Jewish writings following along those lines and listening to people. Even later on, Josephus, Remember the great Jewish historian, he writes about some of the, the things that were done to cause exorcism of demons as was reported and as he had heard. He said, listen, uh, there were uh, priests specifically for removing demons during uh, pre-Jesus times. And, and they talked about this one named Eliezer who cured many demons who had possessed people by uh, taking a root and putting a ring around it and putting it under their nose. That's how they uh, removed demons back then. It was a long, uh, stood-out process. There was a lot that went into, took sometimes hours and days to remove these demons. You hear that today, don't you? In the movies, they talk about those who have been possessed for, for years, and, and when it goes to remove them, the, the hours it takes. I found a quick video National Geographic, August 2008. They talked about modern exorcists. And they showed a woman who was having her demon exercised or, or demon removed. I want to read just for a moment the quote before it gets into that. It says, for Jeanette Modit, those demons are all too real. To talk about demons, things along those lines, are all too real. Tormented for years by depression... Jeanette has turned to spiritual help from the exorcist at Bob Larson's church. This is a young woman who was, listen, she just, she's dealing with a lot of things. She's got a lot of issues. And after an hour of hitting her with a Bible, screaming at her and yelling for the demon to come out, she's so exhausted she's puking. She's so exhausted that she's uh, hyperventilating. She's got all these things going on. And she finally just kind of calms down. They've stopped hitting her and Oh, man, I feel better. After an hour of being tortured, no wonder. It didn't cure her, by the way. She still had the problem. She still was dealing with depression. She still was fighting things. The video goes on to show. The reality of it is people have been doing this a long, long time. When you compare that to the scriptures and facts concerning the scriptures, you see there's a stark contrast, isn't there? When God exercise a demon, when he cast out a demon or demons, or when the apostles or disciples did it, it was immediate. Look at the scriptures there in Mark chapter 7, 25 through 30. But immediately a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell down at his feet. And when the woman was a Gentile, uh, Seropheshesham, by birth, and she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he said to her, Let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs on the table eat the children's crumbs. Verse 29, And he said to her, For this statement, you may go your way. The demon has left your daughter. And she went home and found the child lying in bed, and the demon was gone. As soon as Jesus said he was gone, that demon was gone. 
There wasn't an hours and hours and hours of tormenting people and, and head twisting and all these weird things that people talk about. When Jesus said it, it was done. Those given authority, not everyone who had miraculous abilities could cast out demons, but to those given authority over demons, they could cast them out and it was immediate. Again, I want us to look there at Mark 3, 14 and 15. And he appointed 12. He also named apostles so they might be with him and he might send them out and preach and have authority to cast out demons. Not everyone had the fullness of the Holy Spirit like the apostles. Not everyone could cast out demons. Only those who had been given the miraculous ability to have authority over demons. We look at another passage in Acts chapter 8, 5 through 7. Philip was one of those who had this. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the cross. And the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip when they heard him and saw the signs that he did. <clears throat> For unclean spirits crying out with a loud voice came out of many who had them, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. Again, when authority was given, they were removed immediately. They might cry out. We see that in other passages. But it didn't take even minutes. It was immediate. These spiritual demonic beings caused a lot of pain and heartache for mankind from the time of Jesus walking on the earth for a few years or a short period of time after that. And when we look at it and we examine it, there was a lot of pain that went through it. They're still causing spiritual pain. There is no more of casting out because there is no more possession. Today they are limited to simply temptation as we talked about. Those are the facts. But the big question then remains in our last point for this morning. Why was demon possession allowed? Why did God have it? It doesn't seem to be before Christ and it doesn't seem to take or uh, be long after Christ. As we said, 85.9% of all demon talk is in the gospel account. While Jesus is alive. So why is that the case? Why were they allowed to come in? Why were they allowed to possess? Why did this take place? Though we might not understand demon origin, we can understand why God allowed demon possession during his lifetime, Jesus being on earth, and for the few years or handful of years after his ascension. When Jesus is defending himself against the Jewish leaderships. He had performed a miracle. He had cast out demons. The demons said, you have done this by Satan or Beelzebub, prince of demons. Remember Jesus' response. He tells us why they were allowed. And if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore they will be your judges. Notice verse 20. But if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then... The kingdom of God has come upon you. Jesus said, listen, these were to be a sign that I was coming and that the Messiah is here. We mentioned it last week. Zechariah 13, verse 1 and 2. On that day there should be a fountain open for the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and uncleanliness. And on that day, declares the Lord of hosts, I will cut off the names of the idols from the land so that they shall be remembered no more and also I'll remove from the land the prophets and the spirit of uncleanliness. Listen, it was prophesied that the spirits of uncleanliness would come and that they would be cut off after that. When we examine these and we look at these, Jesus gave the great commission to go out into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And in so doing, he tells us, listen, this was to point out, prove that the kingdom had come. <coughs> demon possession and casting out was for that point that the demon had, uh, uh, that Jesus had come in his kingdom. And this was that, that which they would preach. Notice again, Mark 16, 17, and 18. And these signs, Jesus tells the apostles, will accompany those who believe in my name. They will <coughs> cast out demons, excuse me. 
They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up serpents with their hands. And if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick and they will recover. Remember verse 20 along with this. And they went out and preached everywhere while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the message by accompanying signs. What was that message? Jesus has come. He's Lord of Lords. He's King of Kings. And His kingdom has been established. God allowed demon possession for a time to serve His purpose. And that was to not only prove the Messiah had come, but that He was God Himself. And when He left, that too would go away. Though we may never once again know the origins or many things concerning demonic beings, Though we might not get a lot of details, we know that God has revealed to us that which we can understand, recognize, and which is righteous and holy to study and know, and help those out in the world who struggle understanding such. There are so many today who are inflicted with make-believe because they have been lied to and told they have a demon or something along those lines. Brothers and sisters, thanks be to God, we have the Holy Word. That we can open it up and study it. Let us not only know it, but let us present it to all those around us. That they may understand the doctrine of God rather than the doctrines of demons. And know and come to the truth and one day be heaven bound as well. This morning, as you reflect upon this, as you think about this, I pray that these things are things in which you don't struggle with. I pray that the spiritual side, that the demon doctrines have not in any form or fashion infiltrated your mind or caused you to be tempted, tempted and filled your heart. If this is the case, don't make the change. God again has sent His Son for you and I. And one of the spiritual blessings for those who have obeyed God's gospel plan of salvation is that we simply can go to Him after repentance, confess that sin, and He will forgive us. Remember it no more. 1 John 1 and 9. If there's someone here today struggling with sin, go to God, be forgiven. Repent and confess, and let us help you. Let us bear that burden with you so that you can overcome it. Today, this morning, there's someone here who simply needs the prayers of this congregation. For whatever reason might be the case, for edification, and encouragement or uplifting, let us know. Let us help you by coming forward as we stand and as we sing.